Hello to everyone. Welcome to the seminars of the Astronomy Department of IAGU USP. Uh, and thank you for your presence attending the seminar. Today, we'll have the pleasure of having the presence of Dr. Eugene Vasiliev from University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. The, Dr. Vasiliev, thank you for accepting the invitation and be welcome to IAG, to, to this webinar. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Dr. Eugene Vasiliev. He got his PhD in theoretical physics from the Lebedev Physical Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences in 2007. And since then, he has been working as a researcher at several institutes in Russia and uh, in the USA. And uh, currently, he's a researcher at the Institute of Astronomy of the University of Cambridge. Uh, Eugene works in the fields of uh, galactic dynamics across a range of scales from galactic nuclei with supermassive black holes uh, to the entire Milky Way and its satellites. Today, Dr. Vasiliev is going to present the seminar Dynamics of the Milky Way Globular Clusters and the Satellites in the Gaia Era. Uh, questions can be asked to Eugene at uh, during or uh, after his presentation, if you are in Google Meet, just push the button of the hand to indicate you have a question. And if you are following the seminar on the YouTube channel, you can uh, write down your questions in the chat. Uh, before the seminar starts, I would like to ask everyone to please turn off your microphone and cameras. And Eugene, feel free to start whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, give you some ideas about uh, the dynamics of the Milky Way and uh, global clusters and satellite galaxies. I hope that you can see my slides now. Just to confirm that. Yes. Yes. Thank you. See. Okay. Right. So uh, what you see now is the picture of the Milky Way as seen by the Gaia satellite. I will tell you a little bit about the satellite itself and then proceed to discuss several topics which are related basically to the uh, motion and the structure of the uh, different components of our galaxy, the globular clusters, some of the satellite galaxies, and even their interplay between them. What you see here is the uh, picture of the Milky Way, and uh, dots mark uh, different uh, objects that I'm going to talk about. Globular clusters are um, in, uh, shown by circles, satellite galaxies are shown by crosses, and you see that there are many of them. In fact, there is uh, about 170 globular clusters in the Milky Way, and a few dozen of satellite galaxies, and most of these objects are very prominently seen by Gaia. So a little bit about uh, the Gaia satellite itself. The, this is the spacecraft that is uh, the, main, the main aim of the spacecraft is to measure the positions and velocities and other properties of stars in the, in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies. And it does so by scanning the, sc the whole sky. It's been running for several years now. And its uh, operation is that it basically looks at uh, different parts of the sky. There are two mirrors here. As you can see, the construction of the satellite is uh, rather unusual in that it's uh, actually two telescopes under one roof. So it observes two different parts of the sky simultaneously, and it rotates around its uh, rotational axis, scanning the sky in uh, six hours, and uh, also processing a little bit. So uh, after six hours, it completes one scan and sees a, a the circle on the sky, and then it slowly processes over the time scale of several weeks, completing the scan of the whole sky, and then repeats it over and over again. So over the se several years of the operation, it was uh, scanning the sky several dozen times already. And uh, by comparing the positions and the uh, properties of stars at different moments of time, it can establish the stellar motions and the distances. and um, that is so-called astrometric mission. But in addition to astrometry, it also has a number of other uh, science goals. In particular, uh, it measures the photometry uh, in a uniform way across the entire sky and visible spectrum. Uh, it also measures the line of sight velocities of some of the brightest stars. And uh, the mission, as I said, uh, it started a few years ago. And uh, as of now, it's been running for almost seven years. Uh, and it went through three data releases. The most important for my today's presentation is the second data release, which occurred um, three something years ago. And uh, that was the first one. The second data release contained 
uh, more than a billion stars with astrometric data. That is, uh, for the first time, we were able to see the motion of stars in a significant part of the galaxy. So that's about a billion stars, roughly still only 1% of the entire stellar population of the galaxy, but a sizable step up from what we had before. So this second data release triggered a, a, a huge revolution, basically, in the Milky Way science. And uh, since then, maybe several thousand of papers have been using these data. And what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, of course, a very small chunk of this uh, revolution that's focusing on the global clusters. Uh, as an uh, update to the second data release, uh, more recently, there was a third data release uh, less than a year ago, which uh, was mainly an improvement in uh, precision and accuracy and better calibration. It, the future data releases will contain additional data like uh, broadband uh, photometry and uh, low resolution spectroscopy, and at some point, even uh, time series for all the stars that a uh, guy has ever observed, which will be a huge amount of data. And the mission is supposed to run for a few more years until it runs out of fuel. So that is uh, still an ongoing project, but uh, already a lot of stuff has been possible as of now. Uh, of course, uh, to uh, understand what Gaia can do, uh, you should look at what's the quality of the data, what's the precision of the measurements. And since we are mainly focusing on the astrometry, I'm uh, showing here the uncertainty in the proper motion, that is the on-sky uh, velocity of a star, as a function of the stellar magnitude. So for this uh, uh, data release three, that is the most recent one, a typical uncertainty is uh, 0.01 milliard seconds per year, which is, I think, uh, roughly speaking, the uh, speed with which you could see the human hair growing at the distance of moon or something like this. It's immense precision. And uh, in terms of the physical numbers, that corresponds to velocities. Of course, the velocities are the uh, angular velocity multiplied by the distance. So for a typical global cluster, which would be at a distance of roughly 10 kiloparsec, this would correspond to something like one kilometer per second uncertainty for the motion of individual stars. And for context, uh, the velocity dispersion inside the cluster is typically of order a few kilometers per second. And uh, the velocity dispersion of the clusters in the Milky Way would be of order 100 kilometers per second. So of course, we can measure these uh, quantities pretty well already with this uh, data. Uh, for comparison, I'm showing here the uh, typical color magnitude diagram of a cluster at 10 kiloparsec. So you could see that for the brightest stars, we are uh, reaching the limiting uh, precision. Uh, for fainter stars, the uncertainties are much larger. So those would not be measured very accurately. But if you average over many stars, you still can get uh, pretty good uh, information about the internal motion of stars in the global clusters. Satellite galaxies are typically much further away, roughly maybe 10 times further. But uh, for some of them, we are still able to delve into their internal kinematics also from Gaia, something that I'll talk about in the second part of my presentation today. So of course, in order to study the stars in the cluster, we need to uh, we need a way to separate them out from the field stars, because the guy sees all the stars, and uh, most of them will be just uh, stars on the line of sight, uh, not belonging to the cluster. And uh, here I'm showing a couple of examples uh, of two global clusters. Uh, this one is uh, in a, a more dense uh, field, not closer to the galactic plane. This one is uh, a bit further away from the plane. So you can see that on the sky, there is a bit of over density in both cases centered on the cluster. Here it's uh, less prominent, here it's kind of more prominent. So you can see that there is something here. If you look in the color magnitude diagram, you could also recognize that there are some features that will be uh, much more apparent shortly that correspond to the uh, distribution of stars in the global cluster uh, following the same color magnitude diagram. But if you look in the proper motion space, and that is only possible now with Gaia, and uh, on this day, I, it's hard to imagine how this science was done before Gaia because it's so much easier now. <laughs> and uh, but, uh, but you see in the proper motion space that uh, in this case, even though the cluster itself is uh, sitting in a very dense field of stars, it is separating very, very clearly from the field population. Because this is the very compact uh, distribution of proper motions of stars in the cluster. And this is a much broader distribution of field stars. So if I color it now by the membership, uh, stars of the cluster would be red and the field stars would be gray. You can see that, yeah, now we can very e easily separate the stars of the cluster just based on the proper motion. And if you do only that, you immediately see that they also line up on the color magnitude diagram nicely. For this example, it's much more difficult because the cluster sits in the middle of the field star population. So 
separating it uh, clearly is uh, hardly possible. So you cannot just, uh, well, you can select the stars here and they will be more likely to be cluster stars, but uh, there is always a probability that uh, uh, not all of them are necessarily cluster stars. So what I'm aiming at uh, is to say that uh, a better way of separating the field from the cluster stars and it has a much broader applicability, even not only in the field of studying the clusters, but in, in general, is uh, so-called mixture models. So I'm spending one minute uh, advertising why this is important. Once again, in the case of where when your objects of interest are clearly separated from the field stars, you can just uh, draw a circle here and say that everything in this circle is a cluster, everything beyond it is a field star. But in the case that there is a mixture, you better do it probabilistically. So the idea of mixture models, most often these would be a Gaussian mixture, but that's not necessary. You can write down a more general mixture model is that you write down the distribution of your stars in the, your field of interest as a sum of two different distributions, one for the cluster members and one for the field stars, or you can have more than two, um, have a, a mixture of several components. And uh, the idea is that you maximize the likelihood of the observed sample by varying the parameters of the distribution. So in this case, for example, this would be the position of both uh, centroids of the distributions and also the width and uh, the fraction of stars belonging to the cluster. And you can also add extra dimensions like the distance from the cluster center or the position on the color magnitude diagram. All these pieces of information together could be used to uh, perform the classification. What is important is that uh, in doing so, you not only select the member stars, but you also infer the properties of the distributions. In particular, for the cluster, what we are interested in is the uh, mean velocity, uh, but of course also the velocity dispersion. And that you can get by fitting a model that has a flexible parameter describing the intrinsic width, which after being convolved with the observational uncertainties, gives you the observed distribution of stars in this proper motion space. And uh, when you have this model, uh, then you can uh, look at the inter internal properties of the clusters. For example, the velocity dispersion as a function of distance from the center or the rotation velocity, and here I'm showing a few examples of the clusters that uh, have been analyzed uh, with these data in the, uh, with the purpose of determining the uh, velocity dispersion, which of course is related to the distribution of matter. So you can kind of do a dynamical model, uh, infer the mass of the cluster, infer the distribution of mass as a function of radius and so on. Uh, the rotation velocity, some of the clusters are rotating quite rapidly. In this case, for example, the rotation velocity is roughly twice smaller than the velocity dispersion. Some clusters rotate even more rapidly, but many of them don't rotate that much. And uh, in addition to the guide data, I'm here plotting also the data from the line of sight velocity distributions. So if you think about converting the uh, distribution of proper motions into the velocity, you have to multiply it by the distance. So the distance, if you let it as a free parameter, you can infer the distance by matching the dispersion of the proper motions to the dispersion of the line side velocities. So this is one of the method of, methods of determining the distance to the clusters. And uh, uh, in these plots, uh, there is generally good correspondence between what you get from the Gaia uh, proper motions and uh, what you get from the line side velocities and also the proper motions from the Hubble telescope, which are available for some clusters only in the central parts. Not only you can infer the dispersion, but you can also measure the, uh, because Proper motions is a two-dimensional space. You have two components of proper motion, and you can split it into a rotational part and the radial part and measure the anisotropy. And that is interesting because they, that tells you something about the evolution of clusters. Uh, this can be done not for all of them, but for maybe 2,000 or so. And uh, the, there are a variety of different uh, anisotropy profiles. Some of them even change from being radially anisotropic to tangentially anisotropic. Uh, one cluster in particular, this one is uh, interesting because it has a very strong radial anisotropy in the outer parts. And that is likely linked to the fact that this cluster is a core collapse system. So it has a very dense core and an extended envelope. And the dynamical evolution of clusters occurs in such a way that uh, uh, it tends towards core collapse, but it forms an extended halo where the stars are predominantly on radial orbits. So what we see in the data is a nice confirmation of this theoretical picture of the cluster evolution. Uh, apart from the internal kinematics, as I said, you can also measure the distance from the matching the, uh, any, uh, the dispersion of the proper motions to the dispersion of line side velocities. But of course, there have been other classical methods of study of measuring the distance, mainly photometric 
by looking at uh, specific tracers like RLIR stars or blue horizontal branch stars, or by fitting the color magnitude diagram to the entire cluster population. And uh, here I'm showing a comparison of um, several distance indicators uh, for a variety of clusters that has been uh, compiled by Holger Baumgart recently. And um, the idea is that the literature is full of these measurements. For some clusters, you could get uh, uh, tens of measurements so using different methods. So it was important to bring them on a common scale and uh, determine the overall precision and uncertainty and possibly cross calibrate the different methods against each other. So by now, for the most well studied clusters and for the clusters with a low enough extinction, uh, the uh, relative uncertainty in the distance is typically at the level of 1%. For clusters that are more, more highly extinct in regions, it is higher. Ultimately, Gaia will provide an independent method of calibrating the dis distance from parallaxes. Unfortunately, with the uh, current data release, it's still far from being competitive in terms of uh, precision because of uh, uncertainties over the zero point of Gaia parallaxes, but that will be certainly improving in the future. Once you have the distances, once you have the mean proper motions of uh, the entire clusters, what you can do next is to plot their orbits. Um, so the orbit space is typically, you can think of it as a three-dimensional space. You have the mean radius of the orbit, you have the eccentricity, the difference between the mean and maximum radius, and have the inclination of the orbit with respect to the galactic plane. So you could look at this three-dimensional space in different ways, plotting it in uh, two-dimensional plots and the third dimension representing by color. So in this example, for example, I'm plotting the uh, distribution of clusters as a function of uh, galactocentric distance on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the eccentricity and the color is the inclination. And uh, each cluster is represented by a cloud of points uh, measuring over the, showing the measurement uncertainties, which are typically rather small. What I can see here is that in, in the inner part of the galaxy, uh, for instance, within roughly the solar radius, there are many clusters which, are, which have inclination close to zero. That means that they're moving in the disk plane and have low eccentricity. As you move out, uh, there are clusters that most of them are rather strongly radially anisotropic. You can also see that there are sometimes a group of groups of clusters which have uh, very similar properties. And I'll come back to this point later. Uh, this space, as I, as I said, it's a three-dimensional space. You could uh, plot it into in different ways. And here I'm showing two other examples, which you might have seen or may be seeing in some other papers, uh, the integrals of motion space. For example, here it's the uh, energy vertical axis versus uh, that component of angular momentum, the rotation uh, of, of the cluster. And uh, these lines correspond to circular orbits. So this is the co-rotating in the disk plane. This would be also in the disk plane, but counter-rotating. And um, the vertical axis is essentially the mean distance or the radius of the orbit. This space is, again, different because here I'm plotting the inclination versus eccentricity now colored by uh, by the mean radius of the cluster. So all of them are different projections and all of them are useful in different ways. And uh, what I wanted to highlight here is that uh, the distribution of clusters in e either way you look at it, it's not uniform. They're sometimes clumped and uh, people have studied it a lot. And uh, by now that's an active area of research measuring the distribution of uh, global clusters and other objects in the galaxy, like stars or streams, in the space of integrals of motion. So for instance, uh, the uh, first study that I did it in a systematic way uh, was able to identify clusters which are uh, grouping together in a rather radially isotropic part of space. And um, also there are clusters which are counter-rotating. Uh, there are very few, but there are some. And uh, there are also groups of clusters which are rather strongly concentrated, and that's what we believe belong to a single progenitor. In this case, it's the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy that I'm going to talk about uh, towards the end of my presentation. And uh, uh, this analysis can be done not only for clusters, but uh, for uh, other sta stars in the galactic halo, or for objects like uh, streams. And I believe you had a presentation by Katie Malhan a few, few weeks ago about streams. And uh, all of this analysis is, uh, as I said, it's a, a budding field called the galactic archaeology, which aims to study the uh, properties of uh, stars and where they formed and where, how did they accrete on the galaxy if they were formed uh, outside the 
Milky Way and when that happened and what are the properties of the schematic groups and so on and so forth. So here I'm showing again the same energy and global momentum space. Now uh, showing the stars of the, of the halo rather than clusters. And in this study, Rohan Naidu and uh, people from uh, Harvard predominantly, they were using another survey using Gaia data in, in um, combination with the spectroscopic surveys to not only identify the stars in the uh, kinematic space of uh, velocities, but also in the chemistry space and grouping them into several uh, possibly separate accretion events uh, based on their chemistry and the distinct uh, kinematic signatures. And, um, and this plot, I'm showing another study led by Didier Kreusen from Heidelberg, where uh, they are building a, essentially a so-called uh, merger tree, reconstructing the history of the Milky Way rendered by the global clusters. And again, identifying several individual merger events by uh, looking at the clusters in the space of kinematics and the chemistry and ages and other properties. So by now, that's uh, something that we are able to do uh, routinely. And uh, um, I think uh, this is going to be expanding uh, a lot. By already now, we know that there have been at least several significant merger events that all have individual names, but uh, that's going to be expanding in the future. And uh, last thing about these clusters and uh, these uh, kinematic spaces is that you can use this information to also probe the uh, potential of the Milky Way because the distribution of clusters is not, uh, it's not completely random. If they have been around for 10 giga years or so, they have reached more or less well-mixed uh, steady state. So you can use this assumption to uh, measure the uh, galactic potential by uh, there are different methods like gene sequations and uh, distribution function based methods. Uh, what I'm showing here is based on the distribution function. And uh, the idea is that you find the parameters of the distribution of clusters and the galactic potential, which simultaneously maximize the likelihood of the, of the observed kinematic sample, much like uh, what I've done for isolating stars in the clusters. You can do the same thing by now looking at the population of clusters in the galaxy as a whole. And uh, this, do this does not give a very tight constraints, for primarily because there are only uh, that many clusters, so limited by the Poisson noise rather than measurement uncertainties. But these constraints are lining up quite nicely with a number of other independent probes, um, showing the uh, enclosed mass in the galaxy as a function of the distance. So the outer part of the galaxy is somewhere here. And the inner parts are well measured. And the outer parts, of course, we have much larger uncertainties because we have fewer tracers but uh, larger errors. But uh, still, by now, we are able to measure the total mass of the Milky Way probably to within the factor of two, pessimistically. Some people say that you can do better, but I'm not so optimistic. And the mass in the, within, in the inner maybe 10 kilopar, sorry, a few tens of kiloparsec to much better precision, maybe 10, 20, 30%. Yeah, yeah. Let me, uh, let me ask you a question. Yes. Uh, when would be the tidal radius of the Milky Way? Because uh, we are seeing uh, in this plot still the mass increasing with the radius. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, you mean the uh, virial radius? I think that's the more common name. Yes, okay. the virial virial. yes. yes, the virial radius is somewhere between two and three, maybe 250 kiloparsec. And that's the radius that uh, where the mean density drops to a cosmological level, but it doesn't mean that the galaxy stops there abruptly. Of course, there are filaments of uh, mater material even outside. And uh, what you can say that there, there are satellites and they, these satellites probably have not yet time to uh, be realized. That's the definition. But uh, there is material that it's hard to put a, a strong kind of a sharp cutoff, but it will be somewhere between two and 300 kiloparsec. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So uh, uh, this slide, actually, I'm finishing the first part of the talk about the global clusters and going to switch to dwarf galaxies. So maybe if there are questions about the first part, it's time to ask them now. Hi. Uh, hi, Vasiliev. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask about uh, if you make an orbit integration around the Milky Way, Mm -hmm. You must assume a potential, or as you as you show now, you, you must fit the potential mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. with the whole things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
the kind of the potential that you assume, is it a static one or do you assume a potential, for example, with a time-dependent uh, galactic bar? And if you assume a time-dependent galactic bar and a potential, what are the implications of this kind of potential, potential on the orbital parameters of the clusters? Thank you, that's a very good question. First of all, indeed, these orbital parameters will depend to some extent on the assumed potential. So here I'm, I'm plotting one particular example. If you change the potential, they will move a little bit. The relative positions of different clusters will remain roughly the same, but it could be expanding or it could become more or less anisotropic. The qualitatively, it would not change. But yes, that's true that uh, the potential has an implication, especially in the inner part where we know that there is a galactic bar. And in this case, I'm ignoring the bar. So I'm deliberately making it significant error here in the orbits of the clusters in the innermost few kiloparsec. And there are studies that uh, follow the orbits of, this, of the clusters, assuming uh, accounting for the bar, uh, looking at which clusters become trapped and like X1, or X2, and other types of orbits. And uh, that's another active area of research. But it's more difficult to say whether those clusters just got trapped or they were forming in the bar or uh, anything else. But uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, another open field of study. And that also could uh, influence the classification of clusters, whether you are saying that they're belonging to the disk or the halo or maybe the bulge population. That depends to some extent on the potential. So yeah, I think uh, in order to do it properly, you have to do, to, to do a simultaneous fit, probably. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, if there are any further questions, you can also ask them towards the end of my talk. And I'm, now I'm going to talk about uh, the second part. And by the way, uh, to add to the uh, previous answer, time-dependent potential could also be manifested in a slightly different way that I'm again going to touch upon in the, in the end. Not related to the bar, but something else. Right, so the second part is about the dynamics of galactic satellites. And uh, in fact, here I'm going to shrink the scope uh, quite a lot and consider only two galaxies out of the several dozens of satellites that, that I was advertising at first. You can measure the positions and velocities of the, those many satellites, but for the internal kinematics, that is only possible for just a handful of galaxies. And uh, the first and foremost example is the Magellanic Clouds. So in this plot, this of course is the galactic plane, but what you can also very prominently see here two objects here, which are the Magellanic clouds. As I'm living in the northern hemisphere, I've never seen them, but I see them clearly in this picture. And uh, already in the second guide data release, the Ma large Magellanic cloud was a very prominently featured uh, in this uh, kind of science showcase plot, uh, one of the uh, publicly produced images, which uh, shows not only the positions of stars, but also the motion with this kind of whirlwind pattern. Because uh, even though the Magellanic clouds are at a distance of 50 and to 60 kiloparsec, even uh, then you can get the velocities of individual stars with good enough precision to measure the motion within the galaxy itself. And uh, I should confess that this picture was my main source of inspiration to uh, follow up on the uh, guy related studies because it's so beautiful. And uh, the first thing that I did, I, I've done shortly after the second data release is to take these uh, uh, data and uh, do my own analysis of the motion of stars in the LMC uh, with the goal of measuring the mass again by looking at the velocities of stars and by fitting dynamical models to the measured uh, line of sight velocities and proper motions from Gaia. And um, the uh, outcome of these dynamical models is typically shown in this way as the circular velocity profile as a function of radius. You can do it for the Milky Way, but you can, as I said, you can do it also for individual galaxies, like the LMC in this case. And uh, more recently, with this third data release, which improved uh, upon the quality of the data considerably, the Gaia team themselves uh, have published a much more extended analysis of the LMC. That was one of the science showcase papers led by Xavier Lurie from Barcelona. And uh, in this case, they uh, not only looked at the bulk properties of the population, but also split it apart into several uh, yeah. several stellar populations, like uh, looking at the color magnitude plane, isolating stars from the giant branch, asymptotic giant branch, or young stars in the blue part of the CMD. And it turns out that they have different spatial distributions. Not surprisingly, of course, the young stars are mainly concentrated in the central part, of, where we have this prominent bar, 
and also in some star forming clumps scattered across the galaxy, where, whereas the old stars, like red clump stars, are much more uniformly distributed. But then what is interesting, though, is that uh, these stars also have different kinematics. And by looking at the rotation pro properties, uh, you could see that uh, the rotation speed as a function of distance is uh, higher for younger stars than for older stars. So in the previous plot, I was plotting, I was using only the red clump and red giant stars population. So my rotation velocity was lower. When you do it for a young population, you have higher rotation velocity. And that is a, a very interesting observational confirmation of uh, a theoretical concept known as uh, dynamical heating. Because stars, if they are formed in star forming regions, with a, which are mainly aligned in the disk plane, with a low dispersion of velocity dispersion, they are forming initially in a very cold state. And as the time goes by, they are scattered off uh, various dynamical factors, like uh, the bar, molecular clouds, or just because of the time that they try to, uh, they tend to heat up, acquire random velocities at the expense of uh, regular motion. So we do see in the Milky Way, in our solar vicinity, the strand of uh, younger star having colder, uh, smaller velocity dispersions and faster rotational velocity. And now we are able to see that also in the LMC, which is very nice. Another galaxy that I'm going to talk about more is the galaxy known as the Sagittarius Dwarf. And uh, unlike LMC, which was very clearly seen on the sky, uh, Sagittarius Dwarf uh, is shown here, and you would have a hard time guessing where the galaxy is. And I'm telling you that this is not the Sagittarius Dwarf galaxy. That's uh, one of the global clusters in the Milky Way. And uh, the catch is that this galaxy is sitting almost right behind the galactic bulge. And uh, because of that, it's uh, obscured by much uh, more prominent population of our own Milky Way stars. And because of that, it was only discovered uh, just about 25 years ago. And uh, here I'm showing all the stars in the particular region on the sky. With the color magnitude diagram, you could already see hints that there are there is something resembling a giant branch. If you look at the LMC, this is the red giant branch of the LMC. And, uh, here is a similar feature of the Sagittarius galaxy. But again, there are many more stars in the Milky Way that are obscuring it. But if you look in the proper motion space here, again, I hope that you can see the over density of stars here. It's darker than the bulk of uh, stars. And that is where the stars in the Sagittarius galaxy are very clearly separated in the proper motion space. And if you do the separation in the proper motion space and colors, that's what you get. The Sagittarius galaxy, and remove magically, putting like a magic goggles that help you to remove all the foreground and see only the stars of interest. And that's how it looks like. The, the reduction of the stellar density is maybe a factor of 100 or so um, by doing this analysis. And that's only possible with Gaia. It's a really magical thing. So the galaxy itself, as I said, it's sitting, uh, it's actually what, the closest satellite. It's one of the most massive, but also the closest satellite of the Milky Way. and uh, because of that, it suffers a tidal disruption. And uh, not only the galaxy is seen, but also uh, it forms a long stream of stars stretching, stretching across the entire sky. This stream, again, has been found shortly after the discovery of the Sagittarius galaxy itself by looking at the first all-sky survey in the infrared, TUMAS. And then uh, later surveys like SDSS in the optical band, I was able to see it in much greater detail. But now with Gaia, which covers the entire sky and gives you not only photometry, but also the kinematics, we have a much cleaner picture of the Sagittarius stream. And several studies have, been, have looked at, into it uh, after Gaia DR2. So the Sagittarius stream is the most prominent, by far the most prominent stream on the sky, and one of the largest features in the outer part of the Milky Way. And uh, as I said, it spans the entire sky, uh, stretching more than 2 pi. and uh, uh, the stream. Uh, before I go to the stream, I'll still talk a little bit about the galaxy itself. As I said, the galaxy is right behind the bulge. That's where it is, slightly below the galactic disk. And it sits behind the bulge. So uh, it's the distance from the sun to the galactic center is roughly 8 kiloparsec to the Sagittarius galaxy is three times larger. So it's um, yeah, literally on the opposite side of our galaxy. And uh, by looking at the stars, isolated from the proper motion space. Again, you can plot on, uh, not only the mean proper motion of the galaxy, but also the distribution of proper motions across the galaxy phase. 
And again, that could be used to study the internal kinematics. And uh, in these plots, I'm showing this uh, proper motion space in you know, two dimensions of proper motion and the complementary velocities from the spectroscopic surveys, which give you full three-dimensional view in the velocity space and two-dimensional on the sky plane. And again, if, even though the galaxy is obscured by the foreground, you can see the kinematics very clearly. And because of this galaxy is very clearly tidally perturbed, uh, you cannot really apply the classical dynamical modeling methods like Jean's equations because uh, the galaxy is not in equilibrium. Instead, to understand what happens with the galaxy, we resorted to doing uh, numerical simulations to understand uh, the uh, properties of the galaxy as it moves in the, uh, in the Milky Way potential. And uh, I'll play a short movie illustrating the tidal disruption of the Sagittarius galaxy. Uh, just to let you know, this, um, mm. this is the heliocentric view. This is the galactocentric view. So the sun is sitting here. This is the galactic plane. The Sagittarius galaxy is behind, uh, below the plane and behind the galactic center. This is the line of sight. And uh, the, the movie that I'm going to show illustrates the orbit of the galaxy in the last few giga years. And uh, the idea of these simulations is that you can start from different uh, initial properties of the galaxy, you can make it more fluffy or can make it more compact. And because of that, it will lose a different amount of mass, but also will have different present day properties. And uh, by running the grid of, grid of these models to match the uh, present day kinematics of the galaxy, we can study how it came there and uh, how much mass did it lose over time and what states current dynamical status, whether it's completely disrupting or not yet. So uh, here I'm showing three different simulations where the orbit is the same, but the galaxy uh, size is uh, varying from large to small. And the larger galaxies, of course, more easy to be tidally disrupted. So if I do this uh, simulation over several giga years, every time the galaxy passes near the pericenter, it becomes tidally shocked and it forms the tidal tails. And these tails will look different uh, depending on the radius of the galaxy, ratio of the galaxy radius to the tidal radius, right? So the galaxy that is fluffier loses more mass because it, yeah, not able, not able to keep itself bound. And uh, after it's uh, orbited the Milky Way for several periods, it arrived at its present day state, but you can see that the state is different depending on whether the galaxy was fluffier or more com compact. And uh, most noticeably, that uh, is manifested itself at the, in the angle and the extent of the galaxy um, in, across the, on the sky plane. So if the galaxy was not uh, compact enough, it will be stretched, and it will be less tilted with respect to its orbit. So uh, the observed properties of these three different galaxies are shown here. And you can see that uh, the one that matches the uh, actual observations best is the kind of intermediate case here, which is uh, neither too fluffy nor too compact. Because if it is too co compact, then it will be the, uh, the outer, the more distant part of the galaxy will be too far, whereas the closest part will be too close. And that will not match the kinematics. So once again, what I want to stress here is that doing this analysis, I'm not using any information about the distance to the stars but I'm inferring the distance just based on the proper motions because the proper motion is the velocity divided by distance. So if the, velocity, if the distance is larger, the proper motion will be smaller. And you can infer the geometry of the galaxy purely from the kinematics. And that's the first time that it, was, it is possible uh, with the help of Gaia data. And before we didn't just have enough precision to do this kind of analysis. So by running this large grid of models, we are able to match the present day properties of the galaxy relatively well. And uh, all the models that are successful, they share common features, even if you start from very different initial assumptions in order to match the present day properties, the present day structure is rather well constrained. And then the total mass, you can say, in, uh, clearly see that the total mass is higher than just the stellar mass, a few times higher. So the galaxy, if it is embedded in a dark matter halo, which is more extended, the dark matter halo will be stripped more easily at earlier stages, but by now, the total, the baryonic to total mass ratio is only roughly 25%. And so the 
dark matter is stripped much more easily, but it's still not stripped completely yet. And uh, if you look at the uh, mass as a function of uh, time, evolving it uh, from some initial point, a few years in the past, every time it passes the pericenter, the mass is lost in a kind of stepwise manner. And uh, as of now, we are actually seeing the galaxy almost for the last time, because if you evolve it to further in future, what will happen is the galaxy becomes more and more disrupted. And by the next pair center passage, it will not be a bound system anymore. So we are living in a very special moment in time that the Sagittarius galaxy is just about to be completely disrupted. And of course, since the galaxy is forming the stream, the next thing that you can do is to look at the properties of the stream. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because the purpose of the talk was rather global clusters and satellite galaxies, but I'll say a few words about the stream. And the stream is, a, as I said, it's a very interesting feature, which is uh, spanning the whole galaxy. It spans the range of distances from roughly 15 to more than 100 kiloparsecs. So it probes the galactic potential over a large range of scales and in six dimensions, because we have distances, we have proper motions, we have line side velocities, and of course we have the position. An interesting part about the stream is that we are able to see now very clearly that the stream track is offset from the velocity track. If you think about it, stars stripped from the galaxy will move on orbits which roughly follow the orbit of the galaxy. They will lag behind or be uh, taking over, but uh, they will still move on roughly on the same orbit. However, what we see here showing on, the, on this plot, the stream track on the sky shown in red line, sorry, in black line, and the velocities of stars are shown in red arrows. Okay, maybe it's not very clearly seen, but I can tell you that the arrows are offset from the stream track. And that could not happen if the galactic potential was steady, uh, was time independent, as the stars will move on the same orbits. However, if there is a time dependent perturbation that shifts the galaxy in some way, then you can uh, make the this kind of offset between the stream track and the velocity vectors of stars. And this time dependent perturbation is caused by the LMC. And uh, just to say that uh, this is the observation of the stream, the model, again, running these large grid of body simulations, we are able to reproduce the properties of the stream relatively well, including this offset uh, misalignment between the stream track. And in order to reproduce this misalignment, we had to introduce this extra ingredient into the model, that is the large Magellanic cloud. So the Magellanic cloud, I haven't said it yet, but I'm saying it now, is just on the first encounter with the Milky Way. It has passed its own pericenter very recently, roughly 15, maybe 100 million years ago, for the first time, that's what we believe. And uh, here I'm showing the trajectory of the Magellanic cloud, and it just uh, went past the galaxy very recently. However, since this galaxy is rather large, Sagittarius galaxy is not a big one. And by now, it's less than 10 to minus 3 of the galaxy mass. Sorry, if, yeah, less than 1% of the Milky Way mass. Yeah, less than 0.1% even. Yeah, that's right. But the LMC is a big beast. We believe that the total mass of the LMC is only a few times smaller than the Milky Way. So that cannot be dynamically ignored. And what happens is that as the LMC is moving in the galaxy, the, gal the galaxy itself, the Milky Way, is responding to this gravitational pull from the LMC, and it moves also in, this, uh, in the opposite way. And not only it moves, but it also does not do it uniformly. The outer part of the galaxy are, uh, have much longer dynamical times, so they are not able to respond very quickly to the motion of the LMC. So they are kind of staying in place roughly, whereas the inner parts are moving towards the LMC. And as a result, the inner part of the galaxy are shifted with respect to the outer parts. So that is a very recent thing that several groups have studied now. That is the offset of the outer halo with respect to the inner part of the Milky Way, where we are sitting now. So our reference frame is not inertial. And uh, the whole galaxy is kind of uh, a jelly-like structure that is distorting in a different way, depending on the distance. And uh, this introduces these extra difficulties in interpreting the properties of the stars and stellar streams and satellite galaxies in the outer parts of the Milky Way. And as I said, it was important, necessary to take that into account when modeling the Sagittarius stream, but also it is important for a number of other things like uh, the 
so like it potentially at large distances. And uh, likewise with the uh, Sagittarius stream, you can also do this inference about the galactic potential. And uh, now doing this with the Sagittarius streams and with the LMC and with this offset caused by the LMC, we are getting results that are somewhat lower than what you had before with the global clusters. Uh, but there, not, th those global clusters did not take that into account. That's the next logical step to compensate for the LMC. It is important that LMC seems to be a major player and you cannot really ignore it uh, when studying the outer parts of the galaxy, roughly beyond 30, 40 kiloparsec. If you're looking at the inner part, it's fine because the LMC is presently at roughly 50 kiloparsec. So the inner most part of the galaxy is moving coherently as a, as a solid body, but the outer parts are moving differently. So that concludes my today's talk. And I'm summarizing here that the galaxy studies are revolutionized by the Gaia satellite. And uh, uh, it's an ongoing process. And we learned a lot and uh, we discovered a number of interesting effects. And uh, the field is rapidly developing. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Eugene, thank you a lot for the very nice presentation. Now we'll pass to the questions. I think uh, uh, Elizabeth is the first one, please. Edgy. Oh, hi. Uh, very interesting talk. Thanks. Um, I have a I have a question regarding the uh, the uh, uh, the potential uh, the the rotation curve of uh, mm -hmm. of the Milky Way, and on yes, uh, are there any um, measurable effects of of the uh, I mean uh, be, because of course the these uh, these satellites are affecting the 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 rotation curve of our of, of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we also have the effects of the dark matter, the dark matter halo. Yes, the, the very large dark matter halo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since these precise measurements of the effects of the satellites are, you know, uh, are, are more recent, can you can you say or can you tell us a, a few words regarding the the corrections on the on the dark matter uh, component, if there are corrections? Because because we we know that this uh, this curve is of course largely affected. By dark matter uh, um, uh, attraction uh, in mm -hmm. the upper parts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but is there any specific correction or in important correction uh, for the dark matter component due to these uh, these um, uh, satellite uh, uh, contributions? Mm -hmm. Or okay, so. If I understand correctly, are, are you asking whether the Milky Way satellites are an important uh, mass contribution to the galactic mass Yes. Project, it, or... Sorry, yeah. I, I was a little bit uh, absent-minded. Yes, uh, that, 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 that's the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, out of all the satellites, the LMC is by far the largest. And as I said, its mass is probably between 10 and 20% of the total Milky Way mass. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, other satellites, SMC is probably something 10 times smaller than LMC. The next uh, guy, the two guys are Sagittarius and Fornax and Sculptor. There's another order of magnitude smaller. So in total, I think the remaining satellites are negligible in the mass budget. Right. And only the LMC seems to be the important guy. Of course, right. all these studies, they do have the dark matter halo. As you see in this plot, stars only have a a small contribution to the total rotation curve. Most of it, yeah. large radii, is dominated by the halo. And mm -hmm. uh, another interesting thing that uh, people are still studying now is uh, not only the overall, like spherically averaged mass profile, but uh, the shape of the halo. And right. uh, streams are, in particular, a very sensitive probe of the mass distribution and you know, of the shape. And uh, for instance, for the Sagittarius stream, in order to fit the properties of the stream, we had to make the halo rather strangely shaped, that it was flattened in the inner part and it was flattened in the different axis in the outer part. So it's showing here oh, really? obscure mm. plots. Only then we were able to reproduce the properties of the stream. 
So that is right. something that is a very sensitive probe, but uh, I think it's still far from being settled. I see. Okay. Thank you so much. Very okay. interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, just quick, very quick questions, if I may. Uh, for the work on the LMC, uh, your work and, and, and the one you mentioned on the, uh, the, uh, the 20, yeah, right, that, that one. For instance, how the, uh, the, the um, variable star were classified? Was that f from the light curves? Or colors, or what? Do you mm -hmm. remember? Mm -hmm. or, or your own work? I mean, because you also uh, use the you use the Gaia colors, right? Yes. So Gaia, of course, uh, as I said, it's it's observing the same part of the star, star mm -hmm. sky many times over. So it is able to pro provide photometric uh, variability curves. Already in the second data release, I think they had an internal pipeline for classifying the variable stars and produce something like uh, between. Yeah, the total number of variable stars was probably about a million or so. And uh, stars uh, in the important classes like Aurelius or uh, Cepheids were classified separately. And they, that's probably the, also the largest uh, sample of stars. Okay. Um, that information, I think, is not so for the variable stars, they do not yet provide light curves, if I remember correctly, but they are going to do it in the surrogate release, which is about to happen in less than a year's time. Okay. But of course, for LMC, there are other sources of information. There is the Ogle project, which has been monitoring this field for you know, several decades already. I think that's more complete, perhaps, than Gaia. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, the uh, for the uh, you, you you mentioned about the uh, LMC has, having just passed the first uh, for the first time uh, the uh, close to the galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, how about the uh, interaction between the LMC and the SMC? Have you looked into that at all, or? Uh, how does that affect you know, our interpretation of the you know, Magellanic stream and stuff? Yeah, thanks. That's a good point, yes. Uh, the interaction certainly happened in some way because we see, unfortunately, not in this plot, but uh, in this paper you can find that uh, because they analyzed both Magellanic clouds and in one of their plots they were showing the distribution of stars at larger radii and you can see that there is a stream of stars going from LMC towards SMC. So there are certainly signs of tidal perturbation caused by the SMC or matter flow. Actually, I'm not sure. Maybe it was matter stripped from SMC that uh, that was uh, observed. Maybe both. But uh, certainly that's an ongoing interaction. OK, yeah. Yeah, people claim that. But that stream, that is a different story because that stream is observed in gas, not the stars. And uh, as of now, I think there is no conclusive evidence whether there is a similar feature in the stellar distribution. Yeah, but yes, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I guess I was talking about the Magellanic, Magellanic Bridge, which is actually you know, yeah, yeah, the, the, the street, uh, yes. stars are from, from they, they, it's clean that the, uh, the SMC is just kind of being pulled apart, right? You know, yes, so, I yes, think that's right, the, yes. Yeah, right, okay, yes. thank you. So my final question is a practical one. Uh, you've been using apparently uh, DR2. Uh, uh, if, if you were, Right now, would you use EDR3 or, or DR2 for your research? Does that make any difference at all? Well, of course, now that DR, EDR3 is available, no, no reason not to use it, okay. because uh, it improved precision roughly by a factor of two for proper motions. It also improved the calibration. And uh, there are, in addition to the random statistical errors, there are also systematic errors in parallaxes and proper motions. And those have been improved by more than a factor of two because, because of the yeah, improved uh, improvements in the pipeline. And uh, certainly, the EDR3 is now the, the way to go. Uh, it, it is still, I think, in terms of the number of stars, it's uh, only slightly larger, but in terms of the overall uniformity of the catalog, it's significantly a step forward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's see, Juan, please. Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, so my question is, um, so given the measurement of the, the very precise measurement that you shown on the internal motion of in star clusters mm -hmm. and combining this with uh, these uh, envoy simulations that you shown, would it be possible to infer the black hole population in star clusters? Ah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, another good question. I think with Gaia, it will be hard 
I haven't mentioned that, but Gaia is not coping well with high stellar density regions because it only has a limited onboard uh, computational time and limited uh, capability of process uh, images. So if their stellar density is very high, uh, it's not able to track all the stars in the field of view. It has, I don't know how many, but a limited number of uh, observational windows on the, on, the, uh, on the CCD. So in the central parts, it's suffering from incompleteness and uh, from crowding, which also decreases the precision. So in this sen sense, uh, proper motions from the Hubble Space Telescope are complementary to Gaia because it's able to see much more clearly in the inner part of the global clusters. And for example, in these plots, these uh, purple dots, purple points here are coming from the HST, whereas Gaia is providing the outer parts. So for the black holes, I'm afraid the answer is uh, probably negative in the sense that Gaia will not help much. Oh, thank you. And um, what about uh, the dark matter content in stellar uh, that is, Yeah, that is certainly possible, yes, because uh, by contrast, the outer parts are much clean, much better seen with Gaia. And uh, there have been already several studies that uh, examined the outskirts of clusters to much larger radii than it was possible before. Because uh, when the density of cluster falls behind the density of the field population by several orders of magnitude, you are still able to trace that uh, with the proper motion selection very cleanly. So the outer parts of clusters have been, uh, I think, uh, examined for the purpose of finding the dark matter any indication for dark matter. I think so far there has been no conclusive evidence, but uh, what people did find is extended structures like envelopes and uh, parts of streams. So many more clusters are now clearly seen to produce uh, tidal per tidally perturbed structures than it was possible before. And I think uh, the jury is still open at about the dark matter content of the uh, global clusters. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. It's Maria. Okay, thank you so much for your, your presentation. I have a couple of uh, very naive questions. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, you use or, or people use the globular cluster mergers to study the history of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. comment a little bit on this? Uh, yes, so the idea is that, yeah, maybe I uh, went to the two fast over this uh, section. The idea is that when you're looking in the kinematic space, of integrals of motion, you see things that are co-orbital in a sense. Uh, not, not that they're moving on the same orbit, but they are in the same part of the uh, phase space, meaning that they probably have similar origin. If there was an accreted uh, object uh, like a Sagittarius galaxy, you see the clusters in the Sagittarius galaxy which are clumped together but you also see them in the physical space because they are tracing the stream. But Sagittarius is a very recent star. If something was accreted several giga years ago, like this event, for example, the early major merger in the Milky Way history, which is believed to have occurred between eight and 10 giga years ago, that has not left any coherent structure because it has been phase mixed, but still in the space of integrals of motion, it remains coherent because the stars which were once on the radial orbits will remain on the radial orbits ever since they will be slowly mixing up, but not so much. And that's how people use these uh, kinematic spaces in combination with the other pieces of evidence like uh, chemistry and ages for global clusters mm -hmm. to infer the accretion history of the galaxy. Does it answer the question or does, did you have a- Yes, <laughs> yes it does, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I have another question related yeah. to the Sagittarius stream. Are the, the members, the star members there, I, I guess uh, you could find some stars that are um, grouped together and other stars that are just stars that fall in that stream or what would I you think, expect? Uh, yeah. Well, I think uh, the stars on the, in the stream are rel relatively well separated from the, um, from, from the rest of the Milky Way stars because the stream is at large radii and uh, there aren't really many stars which would share the same proper motion at the same line of velocity and the same distance. So the stream is clearly standing out from, from the field. Whether there are any clumps in the stream itself, I think that's not so obvious. On this plot, you might discern a little bit, if I tell you where to look at, you might see that the stream is actually 
not a single th thing, but rather it has uh, a main component and the secondary parallel component here. And also here, there is a main component and there is another parallel track of the stream. So this uh, bifurcation of the stream is, uh, I would say that's an unsolved problem yet. We are able to see it in the data and the models are not yet able to reproduce it in any sensible way. Uh, so that's only as much we can say about uh, if there is any clumping. Probably that that might be an indication of uh, internal differences, like uh, stars in the pre-existing disk in the Sagittarius versus a halo, or maybe something else, or maybe they had been perturbed by some object uh, in the Milky Way, but I think so far there has not been any successful model that explained this. And uh, all these stars, they, do they share some common properties like metallicity or type of star or? Uh, yes. Really? Yes, I, in the Sagittarius stream, there is even a gradient of metallicity along the stream. So the stars that are more recently stripped, which are remaining closer to the core of the galaxy, mm -hmm. they are also the, in, the, in the progenitor, they were sitting deeper in the potential well. And uh, as typically the metallicity is decreasing outward, the stars that are earlier stripped at uh, earlier times, they are more metal poor. So that has been seen even before Gaia because the chemistry of the Sagittarius stream was studied already from pre-existing pre uh, spectroscopic surveys. Yeah. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia, I have a, here a question from Leandro Beraldo Silva. He's following yes. your seminar from uh, YouTube page. Uh, yes. he, he first thanks uh, you for the nice, nice talk. And he asks, uh, do your results on uh, Sagittarius plus large Mag Mag Magellanic clouds analysis have implications for the scenario of the phase space spiral and bending waves being produced by Sagittarius? Okay, yes, good question. Uh, rather deep on where should I go over this plot? Okay, so the idea is that no, maybe going to the plot showing the Sagittarius going through the disk. The thing is, the Sagittarius galaxy, as being the closest satellite, it does go through the galactic disk at the distances of um, between 15 and uh, 20 kiloparsec. The mass of the Sagittarius it might be large enough to trigger some sort of a density and kinematic waves in the disk. And uh, one of the unexpected outcomes of Gaia DR2 was the discovery of this so-called phase space spiral in the solar neighborhood. So uh, talking about this part of the galaxy, not really related to Sagittarius in any way. This part of the galaxy, the neighborhood of the sun within one kiloparsec from us, where we see uh, very coherent perturbations and uh, the most natural candidate for inducing those per perturbations in the galactic disk was the impact of the Sagittarius galaxy some time ago. For example, when it passed through the galactic dis disk uh, uh, at the previous orbit, like uh, on this plot, it will be um, like this, where it passed through the disk uh, roughly one giga year ago, uh, triggering the perturbations. And in order to do that, it needs to be massive, rather massive. And uh, uh, this is in tension with what we infer about the present day mass of the Sagittarius and about the mass evolution that it had over the last couple of orbital periods. So the models that invoke these uh, Sagittarius to produce the uh, phase space spiral, they typically have the mass of Sagittarius a few times or maybe an order of magnitude larger than what we infer from fitting its present day properties. So now, as of now, this is an unsolved problem. And I think there have been other independent studies that also confirmed that by uh, taking the present day structure of Sagittarius, it's hard to reproduce the properties of the spiral. So the question is still open. Maybe we don't understand enough about the past evolution, or maybe the spiral was driven by some other mechanism, like galactic bar, or maybe a combination of both. I think yeah, it's still an open problem. Thank you. Look. Next, uh, Elvis. Yeah, just go with the flow with Hinaldo's question. Um, maybe I'm just being redundant, but uh do you think that the sagittarius dwarf or even the lmc are the main responsibles for the disc flaring um i don't know to be honest yes i think uh, the lmc is probably too far it has never approached closer than 40 for 
in 45 kiloparsec was the pericenter distance. So hard to see how that could lead to flaring even at the 20, maybe 18, 20 kiloparsec. Sagittarius is uh, more likely, but again, that's much less massive. So it's, yeah, I think, I don't know. Okay, thank you. I have a last question. When you showed the, your calculations uh, simulating the orbit of a satellite a galaxy to, in order to study the formation of the streams, uh, I would like to know if you, the, I mean, the pot self potential of this dwarf galaxy, the distribution of uh, uh, matter, dark matter, is is already well constrained by the observations, or you have to. Uh, uh, you mean guess. this this part about the inference of the Milky Way potential from from the clusters, or what? I, I, I mean, from the from the dwarf galaxy. Um, yes, when you showed the formation of the streaming, is studying the. Yeah, so that is the this one. It's not from dwarf galaxies; it's from one Sagittarius stream only. Yes. Yeah, so fitting the properties of the stream, the sky distribution, the track on the sky, the. Yeah, tracking the proper motion space and so on and so forth by uh, varying the properties of the potential. Yes. So yes, what's the question? It's well, it's ah, if, okay. if this uh, distribution of the potential of this uh, dwarf galaxy, it's already well constrained or you have to put some, you showed some uh, different distributions of the stars. Mm -hmm. uh, you showed the three scenarios and- Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so yes. It, it is indeed a, some sort of a multi-step procedure. First mm -hmm. of all, we, uh, aim to reproduce the present day properties of the remnant. And that tells us about uh, what, what is the present day mass and what's the mass loss history. Because if it loses too much mass, it will become unbound. If it loses too little, it will not uh, match the proper motion field. So that tells us about the mass of the remnant. Next, by fixing that, we are still have some freedom in other parameters of the model responsible now for the galactic potential that could be varied in order to reproduce the properties of the stream. And uh, so you can make it more sharply bent, for example, or less bent, like compare this plot with this one. They are from different simulations. Here it's kind of more eccentric. Here it's less eccentric. So they, now these are controlled by the distribution of matter in the Milky Way by varying the galactic potential and also the mass of the LMC in the past trajectory of the LMC. So all in all, it's a rather complicated inference, but uh, the point is that we are using constraints both on the remnant and on the stream in order to uh, find the parameters of these models. Okay, thank you, Eugene. So uh, I'd like to thank you again for the uh, presentation, for the wonderful presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for attending uh, the seminar. And uh, now we'll close the broadcast to YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And everyone who, uh, who feel like you can open the cameras and make, uh, would like to make questions directly to Eugene, feel free now. <laughs>